I mean, I'm not saying that I was never afraid. I, I don't know. I always depended that if, I always thought, well, if they get me, those people in Cambridge will get them. And then I used to recite this thing from Claude McKay, you know, if, if I'm pinned, I'm paraphrasing that. If I'm pinned against the wall like a hog, let me not die like Welcome to this episode of Rather in the Bars. During the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Liberation Movement, many people will recognize Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, uh, Rosa Parks, Huey P. Newton, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, Ella Baker, etc. One of the people that don't get the recognition that she should get is Gloria Richardson. Gloria Richardson is from Maryland, and she led a tremendous multi-year-long campaign against segregation in Cambridge, Maryland. Uh, so joining me today to just have a conversation about Gloria Richardson is Dominique Conway, my wife. Dominique, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Gloria Richardson was important. Was she only important to black women or was she important to the entire civil rights struggle and the black liberation struggle? I think that she was important to the struggle for human rights globally. I think that black women in particular, women of African descent need to be recognized as, you know, contributing to that larger struggle. Um, and I feel also that while as a black woman, I can relate to her as a black woman who's been involved in social justice movements, I can relate to her strongly. I feel that black men need to embrace Gloria Richardson much more <laughs> as, you know, she stands as, you know, uh, a model for women like me and for younger women, but she should stand as a model for all folks engaged in struggle. In Malcolm X's speeches, he talks about Gloria Richardson and her significance in the struggle. Um, and as I look back on what she did, I recognize that she had started organizing and protesting when she went to Howard University. She got locked up a number of times. And then when she returned to Cambridge, Maryland, which is where she's from, she start organizing to help her daughter desegregate Cambridge, Maryland. Um, and she was so militant that her daughter made her go home, wouldn't let her stay at the protests. Uh, and so a lot of people got from that the idea that she was like for violence. Can you talk a little bit about her attitude towards civil rights and self-defense? Yeah, I think one, um, hearing her name shouted out by Malcolm as I was listening to one of those speeches, I don't know if it was Ballot or the Bullet or what, but that made me, that actually sparked my interest in finding out more about who Gloria Richardson was. But I think also it is her more, her militancy, her defiance, to that I was drawn to. Um, and I feel that, you know, whenever black folks talk about self-defense, it's problematic. When we talk about self-defense, it's almost like we're talking about committing terrorist acts as far <laughs> as, as, you know, white folks and the government is concerned. So generally when people are willing to stand up and they're not going to use the, the tactics of the civil rights movement, which I think is really what Malcolm X was opposed to, the tactics that folks were using, um, that becomes problematic. So, of course, for her in particular as a black woman, because often I feel like we are the outliers a lot of times. We are the ones who, you know, get sidelined in terms of movement and struggle sometimes because of our stances or because of our impatience. A lot of times with leadership that espouses nonviolence or leadership that tells us we need to wait or leadership that also continues the same patriarchal system that we are in under white supremacy anyway. You know, talking about self-defense, 
this uh, iconic picture of her uh, and a National Guard's men trying to stab her or something. You talked to her. You personally talked to her. What did she say about that? Kind of laughingly, she was like, he pointed, I asked her, like, what what was going on in that picture? She's like, he pointed that thing at me or in my face, you know, and she, in her defiance, pushed back. But that that is such a powerful, like, image because of her defiance, because of the body language that you see that she demonstrates in the photograph as well as the gentleman who's standing in the photograph behind her. Okay, because uh, uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that there was like several um, confrontations and shootings between the Ku Klux Klan and racists in Cambridge, Maryland, uh, and the black community. And the National Guard had to be called in and Cambridge, Maryland, during the Civil Rights Movement, was the longest occupied city. For two over two years, the National Guard occupied Cambridge, Maryland, and had them under curfew uh, because of the black community's stand for self-defense. Um, and that ultimately led to Rep. Brown coming in and supporting that struggle. And the, the the famous slogan, burn, baby, burn, comes from that era. Uh, uh, there were bombings. Rap Brown's lieutenant, Featherstone, got blew up in a car. Rap Brown ended up going to jail. Um, uh, so it was an intense struggle that led to the federal government making an agreement uh, with them and and she signed that agreement but then it wasn't respected can you talk about that a little bit yeah she um initially was not eager to sign on to that agreement with bobby kennedy um one because i think in signing the agreement they had to agree to end the protests and she wasn't committed to that that was problematic for her okay oh uh, and they they end up continuing to protest after the agreement broke down. Uh, but one of the things that happened is that the white community, and I think there was 11,000 people in Cambridge at the time, a third of them were uh, in the black community, and the other two thirds was in the white community. And so they put forth a referendum that would determine how the black community would be treated. And, um, and Gloria Richardson organized a campaign against it because her position was you don't give people their human rights and white people didn't have the right to vote for the human rights of black people. Uh, and so as it turned out, uh, a large percentage of the white community supported her stance and the resolution failed um but she was labeled a communist a socialist uh and an agitator but history shows now that the state of maryland uh have actually created a gloria richardson day on february 11th and of course they didn't tell us about it and they didn't tell anybody about it. But the fact that there's a holiday in this state uh, recognizing her work and her achievement says something about her. What do you think that says to young people now if they knew? You know, she has her place amongst, you know, the civil rights movement. But also I see her as one of those folks who was the impetus for say the black panther party and the movements for you know black liberation that came after the civil rights movement and in part came because of people's disappointments with the shortcomings of the civil rights movement it the other part it, what does she mean to young people 
I don't know, because of the point that you made about the state of Maryland recognizing her, but with little fanfare, you know, um, I think that l just like young people cling to the legacy of the Black Panther Party and they're constantly looking to learn from the party, I think that you're going to always have young people who seek these people out. Even though she's passed, there's still there's information out there about who Gloria Richardson was. Um, I think young people will seek that information out and do with it as they need. But she she to me is in the same tradition as Harriet Tubman. I mean, what's the coincidence of them, you know, coming from the, the very same area of Maryland as well? Uh, so she's in that tradition of, of warrior women who stood up, um, who, you know, took on white supremacy. And, you know, that to me is her lasting legacy. But I think that's only a fraction of it. Okay, and it's interesting because you said Harriet Tubman. There's a mural down in Cambridge, Maryland, with both Harriet Tubman and her on it, which is a testament. Uh, something happened when they, they had the march on Washington. They had to recognize her, but they made some restrictions and some conditions. Can you tell us what happened with that march on Washington and what were they trying to do? Yeah, they definitely um, were boxing her in. She was told that she she could not wear, you know, the jeans that she traditionally wore in her work. Um, she had to wear a dress. So in her, her words, she compromised and put on a denim skirt. <laughs> she still was not allowed to speak. Um, she approached the, the mic, was able to say hello, and the mic was taken from her. Um, which to me speaks volumes to the suppression of the role of women in that particular movement too. You know, that all of these things, you know, she didn't chafe. <laughs> she kept on with her struggle. You know, at once she left Maryland and moved to New York, she began to, to work in other fields, but she was, uh, you know, continually fighting for people. Yeah, and one, one good example of that is she worked with the labor unions in New York, and as they were organizing, the officials didn't want her involved in that process. And the white workers, the union members, basically threw down the gauntlet and say, if she can't come, we won't come. There'll be no bargaining and no no negotiation without her and which is a testament to her position of human rights and struggle of all people and not just it wasn't a, a white black thing it was a thing about poor people but that brings me to a point she struggled around the issues of poor people but talk a little bit about her family so, yeah, she, um, Gloria Richardson was, her family was part of the black bourgeoisie here in Maryland. Um, she was actually born in Baltimore. And then later on, even though her, her mother's family was from the Eastern shore of Maryland, her parents moved back, um, to the Eastern shore. I think sometime during the depression, her father had a pharmacy here. And when the depression began, the pharmacy kind of began to go under. So they moved back to the Eastern shore where her mother's family was. Um, I believe her mother's family were folks, who, many of them had been free uh, prior to the Civil War. But what it also seems like to me is that this is where she got this, this race woman, <laughs> you know, like ethic. Um, her grandfather, I believe, was a politician in Cambridge. He she came from folks who pushed an ethic of supporting the community. So it was never just about, you know, lift yourself up um, and keep it moving. It was about lifting up the entire community. And it seems to be that, that that ethic stayed with her. You know, she came in the civil rights struggle with Aurora. And of course, when you seen her, she was very close to, she was, in her nine, was she in her nineties then? Yeah, and uh, she was still full of 
fire and energy and whatnot. And just just recently, just before she passed away, she gave an interview to the the Washington Post, and I think part of the interview was that she was just this energetic and and serious. Can you talk for a minute about that? Um, it seems like to me that she's was very always very in tune with what was happening around her and what was happening out in society, particularly what was happening for people of African descent in this country. And so and I think also, you know, this is someone who was a revolutionary and she never lost that fire. She never lost that fervency for change. Um, and she talked about that. I think she also understood that. Black folks struggle is a protracted battle. It's not something that started in the 60s. It's not something that ended, you know, in 2020 with the protests or will end with Black Lives Matter. You know, uh, at this point, we don't have white supremacy on the ropes. <laughs> so that battle's going to continue. And hopefully she'll stand as an example of someone that, as we've said, young people and, and older people can look to and find inspiration. You know, sociologists and historians now are starting to look at Gloria Richardson, and they're saying that her stance as a Black activist and a a black advocate of self-defense opened the doors for like the gay community the women's community uh other communities because until that time women were put in the background of the civil rights movement even though women did the majority of the work of the civil rights movement they didn't get the mic they didn't get the attention and they didn't get to, to, to speak militantly. She was a pioneer for all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I kind of disagree with that. I okay. think that while well, she refused to be subordinated, um, she comes from a long tradition of black women who refused to be subordinated, whether it was on the plantation, <laughs> you know, whether it was in, you know, during the uprisings in, in the streets here in Baltimore. Um, she there is a tradition among us of refusing that subordination because everything around us has often attempted to push us and st stuff us in the background. It would be safe to say probably that she represented a, a iconic symbol of that struggle that has been going on for 500 years. Um, so do you have any final thing to say about her? Like I've said before, that while she is an example for me as a woman, she also stands as an example for you as a black man. She stands as an example of somebody who has stood up for black folks and we need to embrace, you know, black women more in that role. A little known fact about her is that during the civil rights movement, she was the only black woman that actually led a organization and a network and a struggle and had the leadership in her hands and men and women and children followed her. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, but she was a pioneer in that also. But, but is that true? Because Daisy Bates basically was the leadership for the um, Little Rock Nine. The point is that there are so many black women that has played significant roles in our struggle, uh, in the struggle to make America uh, a human society, a humane society, as opposed to a racist society. And that's something we need to look at and study a little more. Um, and your point of Daisy Bates is like really a good point. Yeah, I hope we can get to that point where we don't have to keep looking at the contributions of black women or, or talking about black leadership and saying, oh, yeah, and black women. 
<laughs> because it doesn't occur that way out in the streets. If you look at the uprisings around police brutality, what you saw, and I'm not talking about Black Lives Matter and that kind of leadership that is a totally different thing, separate from what we see in the grassroots. I'm talking about grassroots people in the street. I saw an abundance of women. I saw an abundance of women challenging police. That has been a continual thing in our community because largely we are a woman-led community if we really want to be honest. Okay, and I think that should be the final word there. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. And thank you for joining this episode of Rattling of Ours.